Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Paris. Ha, ha, ha. Cody Saftik is on the line. Producer Jared is on the sticks. Coming to you a day early. Because I'll be in the President's Cup. Jared will be at the President's Cup. Cody didn't get the invite, unfortunately. Sorry, buddy. Yeah, it's okay. The weather's not great. And I'm not really a golf guy. But uh, yeah, all the same. I wish you guys uh, safe and happy travels. Thanks, buddy. Let's get right into the action because we have 14 fights and I've got a flight in like four hours. So uh, we got Benoit St. Denis taking on Hinato Moicano in the main event. Minus 270 for BSD. Plus 230 for Moicano. Uh, you know, the the hype train somewhat, I guess, came crashing down for Benoit St. Denis last time out there. He looked great early. And then he kind of just, I mean, he just ran too hot, went too fast and... Uh, you know, he got he he learned a bit of a vet lesson there against uh, against uh, Dustin Poirier last time out there. Moicano's gas tank has also been pretty questionable, I think, particularly if this thing gets out of the third round. Um, and on top of that, I don't know if his pace, tenacity, and most importantly, durability. His chin has kind of been a question mark throughout his UFC tenure. Um, grappling could be a wash between the two of these, but I understand in in France, that crowd's going to be absolutely rocking. Last time they were in Paris, it was absolutely absolutely rocking in there. I think BSD gets back on track here. Um, don't really love this matchup for Moicano. It's just Benoit Saint-Denis is just too much of like a dog on the bone. Like He's going to be coming after him, and I don't know if... Moicano has the sting in his punches to really, you know, to earn that respect. So, uh, BSD for me, what about you? Yeah, same here. The UFC knows what they got here in Benoit Saint-Denis. He's like a legitimate fighter out of France, and then they know they can go there and headline. Yeah, he's coming off a loss, but he's the A-side here, and they're basically putting a card around him. When I look at Benoit Saint-Denis, I see a guy that, like, if he's not a future world champion, he'll be a future title challenger. He will fight for the belt. I think the guy's got the goods. You look at his UFC debut, loss, but it's on short notice, about 170 pounds. And that was the night, Paul, we realized the guy can dig an insurmountable amount of damage. But since then, he's been a dog and a bone, just like you alluded to. He goes in there. He's very aggressive. He's pursues the takedowns. He doesn't mind opening up with strikes. And everything he throws is just absolute heat. Part of me wonders, can the guy actually keep up this pace? The other part of me is like, why not? Because he's not slowing down any of these fights. Runs right through Nicholas Stolf, who chokes him out. That's a BJJ black belt. Chokes out each um, bomb theme, BJJ black belt. Uh, the Thiago Moises fight, five takedowns. Absolutely beats another BJJ black belt. Hand over foot on the ground. I mean, he's putting a mauling on him and eventually TKOs him. But all the same, it's like his grappling seems to be top notch. The, the next fight against Matt Frivola, head kick in like nine seconds. He just comes right at you. And what do you do? You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you want to stand with him, yeah, you might be able to get a jab working. You might be able to use a couple distance strikes, but he's not fighting you at distance. He's constantly being aggressive, closing that distance, closing that pocket, and just unleashing shots on you. So he's a dangerous guy to try to operate with on the feet. And then on the ground, again, I mean, he's been just wrecking BJJ black belts. His takedown game seems to be top-notch. His physicality is top-notch. And then he runs into Dustin Poirier. Now, I'm going to make a big excuse for him here because it's what I've been thinking since the get-go. I bet him that night. Um, he shows up. He's got a nasty staff infection on his head. His forehead has a nasty old staff on. And then the first round against Poirier, he goes balls to the walls, right? He wins the first round on all three judges' scorecards against a former champion, a proven commodity, a badass guy. He does what Benoit saint Denis does. The second round, he goes back to doing what he does. And for the first time, he flat gasses. Now, everyone's saying veteran performance from Poirier and uh, Benoit St. Denis ran into his limitations and maybe pushing that kind of pace isn't wise, but I'm going to make a flat out excuse that the guy had a nasty staph infection. He says post fight that he was sick all camp. He knew he couldn't fight Dustin Poirier for an extended period of time. So he decided to just full throttle and see if he could get him out of there when he did not get him out of there. He was left in a compromised state. So if you, if you want to accept that excuse for him and you look at him here, this is a guy that healthy, maybe trucked uh, Dustin Poirier and then what? And then what, Paul? How big of a favorite is he in this spot? Is he coming off a win over Pori? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the cards didn't play out in his favor that night, but I think he's got all the skills in the world. And again, he's only 28 years old, so the best of him is yet to come. His skills are constantly getting better. 
I would prefer if this was a three round fight simply because yeah, he's coming off a loss and he did technically speaking, no excuses. He, he did gas out in that fight staff or not. So yeah, I would rather see him in a three round fight. I think he beats Moicano all day, five round fight, maybe a little bit dice here, but, but again, another point that you brought up, Moicano is not exactly known as a cardio guy. Now we all love him and he's undefeated actually, since he's become money Moicano. So he's definitely fighting for more of a purpose these days, the money. And it's been working out for him, but there's no doubt about it. I mean, he is who he is. He's an entertainer. He's willing to take these big spots because they pay better. But there, there is a path to victory there. He can beat Brad Riddell with the submission because he can take Brad Riddell down, a natural kickboxer, not a great grappler. It's not going to work on Benoit Saint-Denis. The Drew Dober fight, he it goes three full rounds. He landed 23 significant strikes over Dober and three takedowns. He just neutralizes him. If you're not taking down Benoit, let me tell you, 23 strikes, it ain't getting it done on the scorecards. No. Especially not in Paris, France, where the guys get into God status, right? Isn't his nickname the God of War? <laughs> Anyways, they love him there. You're going to have to put a beating on this guy and finish him, and I don't know when I see that. And then the Jalen Turner fight, of course. I was high on Jalen Turner. Turner drops Moicano. He hits the deck like a sack of potatoes, and Turner turns around and walks away like he's Mark Hunt or something. Uh, Moicano pops back up, the round ends, and then it all goes downhill for Turner, who himself gasses out. Again, if Benoit doesn't have a compromised staph infection or he's an ill and he's ready to go, like I don't think that he just gasses after one. I think that when you hit the ground from him dropping you, he gets on top of you and puts that consistent beating. So all your points I'm agreeing with. I got Benoit Saint-Denis, minus 270. I agree with it. Had he beaten Poirier, he'd be minus 600. Love me some money Moicano personality-wise, but in this betting spot, I think that Benoit Saint-Denis just comes out here and does his thing. Yep. All right, we've got Nasruddin Imovov taking on Brendan Allen, minus 210 for Imovov, plus, two, plus 180 for the underdog Brendan Allen. Who you got here? Yeah, I'm going to take an undershot on Brendan Allen. It's not like I'm super high on it or anything, but the plus money definitely makes sense. Imovov's definitely another one of these only 28-year-old uber prospects that's going to continuously get better and better. In a couple of years from now, you might see his best game. But as of right now, I'm not fully sold on his uh, defensive grappling. So you look back at his record, obviously the loss to Phil Hawes, he got taken down four times. He got largely neutralized. He had no answer for it. Then the UFC does what the UFC does. Book him against strikers. It, it, his defensive grappling got exposed hard that night. So they book him with a striker and Ian Heinish, and he beats him. Then he, they book him with the striker, Edmund Shabazian. They book him against a striker, Joachim Buckley. Then a striker uh, with uh, Sean Strickland. Then a, a striker with Chris Curtis. Roman deletes, I'm not really sure what it is that he does, but, you know, I don't know, a bit of everything. I can't really say he's a potent grappler. And then Jared Cannonier is another striker. So they've gone in an entire stretch here where he's not fought any one opponent who would be coming in with the game plan of, I'm just going to take this guy down and wreck him on the ground. But overall, his takedown defense, 74%, sure, not really fighting a whole lot of wrestlers. There's been times where I thought his cardio wasn't all that good. Again, you can go to some of these spots, gas is in the Phil Hawes fight, gas is in the Jordan Williams fight, gas in the Sean Strickland fight, although that one was short notice up a weight class. Um, but yeah, as of late, yeah, they've been booking him in a lot of these five-round main event fights, and his cardio looks solid against Roman Deletes. It looks solid against Jared Cannonier. I don't think that he's got this cardio problem. I think he's fixed that. But now they're drawing him back to a three-round fight. So he can't rely on just landing more volume and more damage in the bigger shots over the course of five. He needs to get at it right away. And again, when I think of Brendan Allen, it's like this is what he's been doing. His last fight against Chris Curtis, who notoriously has excellent takedown defense, he took him down six times. But it's six times on 13 attempts. And that's okay by me because the 13 attempts, it shows his game plan. He's not looking to strike with Chris Curtis. He did that one time and he got knocked out. He's going to stick to pushing you up against the cage, neutralizing you, and eventually getting you down. He took Paul Craig down twice. That's no big deal because Paul Craig wrestled to save his life. Andre Muniz, high-level black belt, subs him. Bruno Silva, not a black belt, subs him. Christoph Jocko, mimp, subs him. Uh, Jacob Malkoon, I, I don't know. He was lucky to win that fight. But but again, he was out grappling in certain areas. Two takedowns on Malkoon. Nobody takes Malkoon down. You know what his game plan is. Is gonna. I don't think he's a stupid guy. I think he's got high ring IQ and he fights to his skills. He's been very adamant that he's the best grappler in the division and he wants to prove it. He lost to Chris Curtis by standing in front of him like an idiot. He wins against Chris Curtis by fighting that grappling type game plan. Coming into this spot against Imovov, that's what he goes to. He, again, another young fighter, I believe, again, only 28 years old, getting better, trains like a madman. If you've ever met him in real life, he's gigantic. And I think that there's a clear wrestling and grappling advantage over there. It's only a three-round fight, so you really only have to take him down for the first two rounds. It's in France, I get it, but 
if you get on top of this guy and you you know you're out grappling him, you're on a uh, you know you're racking up some top control, you're landing a little bit of ground and pound, you're threatening the submissions. They can't rob you, right? So just win the first two, run away in the third if need be. If it's even money, which I'm actually lining this up personally, striker versus grappler, both talented prospects, both bring excellent um, skills to the table. I got it even in my head, and then the line just does not believe that so yeah i mean it's a dog shot for me on a personal level yeah i'm with you 100 percent. i mean he's on a seven fight winning streak taking down chris curtis six times is a massive massive feat i mean imvav also took him down three times they both fought chris curtis um so yeah it should be relatively competitive i'm not gonna be shocked if brendan allen doesn't get the job done but um he's got more tools 28 years old seems like he's coming into his own and they're giving us a good dog price um you know, not all the French favorites are going to win, so I take a dog shot with you on Brendan Allen here. We got Joe Anderson Brito taking on William Gomez, minus two eighty for Brito, plus two forty for Gomez. I mean, I feel like I say this every single Brito fight, but physicality, man. Um, I haven't seen anything from Gomez to lead me to believe that that he's gonna earn. Joe Anderson Brito's respect. So Brito will be up in his face, maybe making a little bit ugly, holding him up against the cage early in the fight. Probably has a massive grappling advantage if he does get it to the map, but he's throws absolute heaters. The guy's just, for 145 pounds, he's just so damn strong. Um, I've never really been a Gomez guy. The volume is super, super low. It's technical, don't get me wrong, but... Um, yeah, I think Brito absolutely smokes this guy. What about you? Yeah, I think Brito smokes him too, but but feels like a trap to me. I'm going to take Brito. He is a play. Not going to put him on the top line. Feels a tad bit trappy. So with Joe Anderson, Brito, yeah, the guy's a madman. Just like Paul mentioned, he's always in your face. He's always highly aggressive. And he's a very win condition is very much the finish. He's finishing all these guys. Knocks out Andre Feely. Who does that? And he does it in 41 seconds. Takes out Lucas Alexander, first round submission. Weston Wilson, first round knockout. Jonathan Pierce, losing that fight and looking terrible. And then catches him with a second round ninja choke. And then Jack Shore's last time out. They stopped the fight because Jack Shore cut his shin. But Joe Anderson Brito was beating his ass before the, they stopped it due to a weird stoppage, but right guy won kind of deal. He's looking to finish you. One has to wonder if he's got the cardio to really sustain that over 15 minutes. If you look at him on the contender series, he beat Diego Lopez. That one aged really good, but it's a technical decision because he gets eye poked in the third and then he basically quits as he can't see. And he knows he won the first two rounds, so he gets a technical decision. His very first UFC fight, his debut against Bill Aljeo, he loses. And again, he kind of gasses out in that fight. You look at him, he's a hot starter, but against Bill Aljeo, went to decision. He only landed 40 significant strikes. Feely, he blasts him right away, 14. Lucas Alexander, he only needs four. Weston Wilson, he only needs 22. Jonathan Pierce, only landed eight significant strikes before subbing him in the second round. And then Jack Shore's last time out. If you watch the Shore, if you watch that fight back, he's just walking Shore down. He's landing big, but then again, numerically, he had only landed 30 significant strikes. So this is why it's a little bit trapping me. Gomez is, again, he is a low-volume guy, but he's only 27. He's out of MMA Fight Factory Paris. So he's the hometown guy. He's got the hometown crown behind him. The hometown gym. Training partners with Imvov. And as Paul mentioned, he's a very clean striker. He's low-volume. But his problem is that he, he, he touch and go. He's not looking to knock you out. Sure, he beat Gear Moody with the body kick, but he's very much a point-style kickboxer. So he just hits you from distance, and then he runs away. He hits you, and he runs away. He's got quick footwork. He's a very speedy fighter. And it works against guys like Joannis and Brito who are shoot-to-box guys. They're very flat-footed, and they're just marching forward, throwing bombs. So if you can just time it well, you know, you can jab kind of with the right hand and then move. They're usually whiffing at air. You don't need to land 100 significant strikes to beat Brito. He's low-volume, too. Everything he throws is a cooker, but he's a low-volume guy. So, I mean, Gomez's low-volume style is not terrible against that. If he just ups it a little bit, if he works those kicks and then he runs away, by the third round, Joannis and Brito might be tired from chasing him around. You're not seeing Joannis and Brito in the third round. You're not seeing Brito go a hard 15 minutes. So, if he gets tired from chasing this guy around, he's in a foreign country, you to fly all the way down there, you're chasing this dude that's backpedaling, stiffing you with one or two, the crowd goes wild every time he lands some meager little shot on you, and they don't care when you unload one of these bombs. It's going to make it look a little bit closer than need be for a minus 270 favorite that's otherwise better everywhere, right? He's the entertainer. He's the kind of guy you want to watch as a fight fan. He's got a BJJ black belt. He's very strong physically. I think he wrecks Gomez. Part of me is the, the hometown cooking. The guy's just going to evade, 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 evade. 
I, I could see a scenario where Drew Anderson Brito just has the most frustrating night of his career and can't catch him. But the reason why I'm not just going to take this wild underdog shot on Gomez is I go back to that Francis Marshall fight where Marshall got two takedowns in five minutes of top control. <laughs> if he's taking you down, Drew Anderson Brito at some point is going to corner your ass, get a hold of you, peel you to the ground. And then at that point, I think he racks up top control of his own, right? So as long as he doesn't gas, as long as it's not 1-1 going into the third, can honestly see him blowing this, to be honest with you, Paul. But I, I, he is going to be the play for me. Yeah, I mean, even the um, the Shore fight last time out, Shore a great a great grappler in his own right. Like he controlled that fight for five He's minutes. A strong guy, man. Yeah, five minutes, and like he wasn't looking. Like I know the the cut on the leg was completely fugazi, really, really dumb. And people who bet Shore would have felt bad. But like if you bet Shore, it's like you're down two rounds. You need to finish if this gets into the third round here. Um, like it was, Brito was well up on all. Like he would have been twenty eighteen on all scorecards uh, at that point. So I don't know. Maybe maybe he's worked on that cardio. That Diego Lopez uh, win from Contender Series has aged like a fine wine at this point. But uh, that's a totally different discussion for another day. Um, but yeah, I guess traveling over there. I don't know. Both of them are relatively low volume. I just think physicality. I mean, if it's in the apex, it's at this price. You probably love this number a lot more. Uh, small cage and all that. but um, Small cage in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I'm in. In Paris with a big cage. That. With a guy that, again, if you watch back Gomez, he's fleet-footed. He's not He's not well, risk of, he's risk of risk. He's, he's not looking to go in there and bang it in with you. And that's what Brand, uh, Joe Anderson Brito thrives on. Last point being Jack Shorewind looks really good. Jack Shore is a bantam weight. His best works at 135 pounds. Like, he got in there with Brito. It was pretty clear that Brito was twice his size. And then as such, he beat him like he was twice his size. So Gomez, a bigger guy, definitely faster than Brito. Again, like it could be one of those really close decisions that they just end up giving Gomez his way. He's won a split in the UFC already. I don't know. Just a little bit of buyer beware. All right. We've got Brian Battle taking on Kevin Jusset. Minus 175 for Brian Battle. Jusset can be had for plus 150. I'm not going to lie, Cody. I didn't even know that Jusset was French. Can't really recall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he yeah. trains out of Auckland with City Kickboxing and all of those guys. <laughs> Does he have like a French accent? I can't really recall any of his like post fight interviews. Is he like French, French or like French? Are the fans yeah, going to be jazzed he, up for Juicette? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, well, yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Because just like Canada, when they're just like Julian Robertson, one, it's like she's from here <laughs> not really but i tell people all the time julian robertson niagara falls what's up what's up because it's like you're clinging on to what you can they got him on the main card for a reason he's definitely one of their guys and yeah no he spends his childhood and his adult life in france and then eventually comes over to uh to new zealand for uh, transit city kickboxing and he's been there for a number of years so i uh, i mean accent or not doesn't really matter but uh this is a dog spot I actually quite enjoy. It's up to Kevin Jusset to go out there and fight the winning game plan, but I think he's got the means to do it. So Brian Battle, listen, I'm a, I'm a Brian Battle fan, North Carolina boy, absolutely, you know, fun, exciting style. And what he does better than a lot of the guys in the division is that he strikes off his back foot very, very well. So if you want to march him down and come at him, he just counters, not so much that he's just an excellent counter puncher as much as he can throw a ton of volume while backing out and just racks up these decent numbers. Problem is, is that I don't think he can grapple. I don't think he can grapple at all. I think he's been able to, similar to Imovov, but at least Imovov's fighting the best guys in the world, he's been able to largely avoid grapplers and able to look like maybe, maybe he's well-rounded. But I think there's a glaring hole in his game. You look at the fact that Gilbert Urbina takes him down twice, it's problematic. Teresian Gore takes him down twice, that's not a good sign. Uh, Renat Frakhardinov, seven takedowns. Okay. Seven takedowns against Renat Frakhardinov, not the end of the world considering Fakradino is an excellent grappler, but he's not a top, top notch grappler. In fact, you've seen him recently struggle to get these guys to the ground. It's the fact that he went seven for nine on takedowns and had 14 minutes and 11 seconds of mm. control time. So the entirety of the fight is Fakradino taking him down whenever he wants, getting on top of him. Brian Battle has no ability to shrimp, no ability to cre uh, create space, no ability to get back up to his feet. And as a result, he landed three significant strikes in 15 minutes, and got control for 14 minutes and 11 seconds, gave up seven takedowns on nine attempts. So he cannot grapple. He cannot grapple. So they book him against Gabe Green. Now, Gabe Green's a, a banger, right, and shoots zero takedowns. The fight lasts 14 seconds. Then they give him A.J. Fletcher. A.J. Fletcher is a former football player, very green in MMA, half-heartedly tries two. 
Prime Battle stuffs those. Angelusa, Angelusa is a kickboxer at a Kill Cliff FC. Caused him to quit in the second round, but he's fighting like these mid to actually not mid, low, low level strikers. Nobody's attempted to take him down. Nobody's able to control him there. If somebody was to go out there with that D1 game plan of I'm just going to chain wrestle this guy or create a lot of problems by just pressing him up against the cage, giving him no space to operate it, what does it matter if he can throw strikes off his back foot? Pit him up against the cage. Take him down. That's the key. Now, Kevin Drew said because he's at a city kickboxing, he the mentality here is he's a kickboxer and he wants to kickbox, and that's fair. The guy knows how to kickbox. But you watch any regional show tape on him, his kickboxing is actually super like stiff and rigid. Where he shines is on the ground. He's very physically strong. He's got an excellent takedown game. When he gets on top of guys, he has a propensity to just eventually work his way to the back, grab the rear naked choke, take them out. His UFC debut against Kiefer Crosby. Crosby's actually working him a little bit in the first round. I mean, he's throwing a high pace, and Jusset's unconcerned about it, probably because he trains at City Kickboxing. But by the numbers, Kiefer Crosby's up 39-29 to in that first round on significant strikes, and then Jusset just lands one effortless takedown, immediately works to his back, immediately cranks his neck, Kiefer Crosby's out of there. Okay, fine. It's a low-level win. So then he gets Song Kanong. Song Kanong, again, he didn't really rely on his wrestling. He did end up picking up one, but it's one on two attempts. He knew he could beat Song Kanan standing, so he did that. He lands 134 significant strikes, throws 235 significant, but only lands 57% of them, and then does very much moving forward, solid cardio, solid durability, doesn't opt to use his grappling in that fight, but you know he can. So now he's got this fight with Brian Bow. Well, Brian Bow's best asset is that he could potentially throw up high numbers in the striking in the significant strikes. But Jusek can do that too. Mm-hmm. Brian Bow likes to fight off his back foot. Jusset likes to go forward and optically that looks good to the judges and then if Jusset just uses a little bit of ring IQ here he takes Brian Battle down and he works him on the ground and he's a plus money underdog and he's in France I, I'm in on Kevin I, I'm actually got six underdogs on this card well three like even money they're like plus 120 kind of dogs mm. uh three bonafide dogs you know, dogs, sometimes you're chasing a price like the Brandon Allen fight. Sometimes you're chasing this. I like Kevin said, dude. I like him. And the fact that he's plus money, even better. Yeah, I can't really disagree with too much there. I mean, if it just turned, if, if wrestling completely gets negated and it's a stand-up fight between the two of them, you probably have like a very 50-50 fight and you're giving me a 10% edge on that at plus 150. So, um, and then if Jusette does have the wrestling advantage that you're talking about there, even better. So definitely not betting battle at minus 175. Jusette will also be the pick for me in this fight. All right, we got Morgan Cherrier taking on Gabriel Miranda. Cherrier, a minus 700 favorite. Miranda can be had for plus 500. I realize it's in Quebec, or in Quebec, in, uh, in France. I'm going to Quebec. Um... But Sherry Air minus 700, Cody. That's disgusting. This guy's low disgusting. volume. Disgusting. I know he's athletic and he's got the look. It's like everyone wants him to be something super special here. But it's like, frankly, from his performances, I haven't seen it. Now, I know Gabriel Miranda, he's flying over from Brazil. He's definitely more of a potent finisher. Comes at you super hot and heavy uh, early. Um, I don't know if he's a real, real master of anything, but... Definitely going to be interested to see, like, maybe what, like, his, like, submission prop is uh, later on in the week. Um, no way I possibly get to Sherry Air minus 700. I wouldn't feel comfortable laying chalk with a guy with just, we've talked about it pretty much every single fight with him. Even on the regional scene, it's kind of the same stuff with him. It's just, like, low volume, like, close decisions a lot of the times with him. And um, I don't know. I just... He's getting a lot of respect, and I just haven't seen it on tape. Um, it's a, it's a dogger pass for me. Probably a pass on the money line, but I'll be looking at some props. What about you? Yeah, I agree. It's just it's way too big of a favorite. I mean, it, it screams this is a top ticket guy. This is a lock, and there's no way he loses. But he's got the same issue now that he's had throughout the course of his career. Extremely talented, good amount of power, solid takedown defense, good fighter. Just doesn't really have that much intensity if he doesn't finish you outright it's a lot of just going through the motions he doesn't put his foot on the gas he's not the clear victor in a lot of these rounds and i mean history basically shows itself in 2015 he picks up a split decision loss against this martin avision right fast forward to 2018 
He has a majority decision loss to Ruslan Kazmorayev, right? Uh, that same year, he has a split draw against this Marko Kuvancic. Then the very next fight against Sorenbach, he loses a majority decision. So, so at least one judge thinks it's a draw and two thinks he loses. That's two majorities and three splits. Then he beats Lewis Monarch by split decision. He loses to Jordan Vukovic by split decision. He loses to Paul Hughes by majority decision. He beats Daniel Bazant by split decision. Uh, he loses to Chepe Mariscal his last time out by split decision. So he's like three majority decisions and five split decisions or six split decisions in the course of his career. It's nine fights that the judges were like, I really don't know. Pretty close fight. And the Chepe fight's the same thing. Like he gets outstruck by Chepe. By the numbers, he's getting outstruck by Chepe. He gets taken down by Chepe. And yet at the end of the fight, and I'm reading on Twitter how everyone's like, ah, man, I thought he, I thought he won. I thought he won. Why did you think he won? Because they say damage in the first two rounds. So even though the other guy's out landing him, he... He landed the bigger shots. Yeah, okay, that's all fine and dandy. If you don't knock the guy out, he's outworking you. These rounds are close. I, I, if he was the underdog, yeah, I think the guy's really talented. If he's a short plus month or a short favorite, sorry, maybe minus one seventy or minus one forty, minus one fifty, minus one sixty, something in that nature. I get it. He's in France. He should win this fight. Like at minus seven hundred, you got to be certain that he's absolutely going to go and wash out Gabriel Miranda. Because if he doesn't, he's going to go to the scorecards. And even though he's in his own backyard, I get it. He's had a lot of these fights where he's been on the losing end of split decisions and fight that people thought he won, but the judges don't agree with. So he just at this price point, if he's in for a close fight, you don't want no part of it. Gabriel Moran, it's not like this guy's like a world beater. He's actually 34 years old. Sherry is a little older himself. They're two older fighters. But yeah, I would say that Morgan's pretty cast iron. Like the guy's very durable and he does hit hard. Whereas Miranda, he's able to finish guys. And then if he doesn't finish them, he himself has been a little mm -hmm. bit susceptible to getting choked at or finished. So Taking down Sherry here is very difficult. I think the only guy to take him down was Chepe Mariscal. And Mariscal went one for six on takedowns, and he's a judo black belt at least. With Miranda, he doesn't have the physicality. I don't think he's going to take him down. Therefore, he needs to stand and trade with him. And whereas he might be able to use a little bit of that range early, pop out a couple jabs, you know, keep it close and competitive. At some point, one of those body kicks sneaks through. At some point, one of those those right hands sneak through, and, and Sherry starts to turn the, the tide in his favor. So I think Sherry wins. But mine is 700. My God. Uh, he's the play. No doubt he's the play. At what at what stage do you put him? Yeah, not on the top, just because in my mind, there's at least a couple red flags. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED lights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. We got Fair Ziam taking on Matt Frivola. Minus 130, a 4 Ziam. Frivola can be had for plus 110. Who you got? Yeah, I swear I'm not just being lazy on this episode. It's just how the card actually shakes out. Is that you got a lot of these guys that are, I'm going to say, one-dimensional strikers. They want to strike. They come from Muay Thai backgrounds. That's what they do. When they get matched up with grapplers, they generally look like fish out of water. But the UFC's done an excellent job of being able to match them. Fraz is another one of these kids. He's young. He's long. He's talented. And he comes from a Muay Thai base. Don Madge takes him down three times. Jamie Malarkey takes him down five times. Luigi Vendramini took him down. Michael Figlak took him down. And in his last time out, Claudio Puelos, a known guard puller, takes him down seven times, Paul. Overall, he's rocking a 67% takedown defense versus 23% takedown accuracy. Clearly, wrestling's just not his strong suit. Now, the guy's an excellent kickboxer. I wouldn't say that, or Muay Thai guy. I wouldn't say that he necessarily has a ton of power it's as much as he keeps throwing that teep kick up the middle he's got a long jab he's got some decent volume he's able to keep opponents at bay the large cage in theory should very much help him but they've been largely matching him up against guys that are, are strikers for the most part um his lone loss sorry he loses to don madge who just took him down and controlled him and he loses to terrence mckinney who's able to get him down and catch him in a rear naked choke so 
again, you you know what the issues are in his game. Matt Frivola, meanwhile, you got to recognize that Matt Frivola is out of Marab Devashvili's camp with Matt Sarah and Aljamain Sterling. And the gym, at their best, are some of the best grapplers in the world. His buddy just wins a UFC championship fighting a talented striker by being able to neutralize his grappling. Frivola is an excellent grappler. He can strike too, but his chin's no good. Polo Reyes knocks him out in a minute. Lando Venata, clean, two clean knockdowns. Terrence McKinney, seven seconds. And Benoit, Daniel, uh, Benoit St. Denis in his last fight, a minute and a half. So he cannot take a punch. Now, Zion's a better striker, but Zion's not a power puncher. So I'm not like super worried that Zion catches him with something clean. Possible, no doubt about it. But at least he's not one of these brute force Benoit St. Denis or Terrence McKinney type guys that are absolutely just going to smoke you out of the water as soon as the fight starts. He should have a little bit of time to operate. Guy's got a win over Drew Dober where he's able to dog walk him. He comes forward. He's very aggressive. I've met him in real life. He's big boy for the weight class. And he's got excellent grappling. He doesn't always utilize it, but it's there. You look at his last couple of fights. He took down Benoit St. Denis twice. Got knocked out a minute and a half, but he scored two takedowns over him. Pretty impressive. Went the distance with Amy, uh, with uh, Armin Sarukian. Yeah, he got thrashed, but uh, he went the distance with him. He was able to hold his own in some of those grappling uh, department, those spots. Four takedowns over Jalen Turner. Two over Lando Venado, who wrestled in college. I would say Ray Longo, Matt Sarah, Marab Devashvili, Aljamain Sterling. Someone's just got to pull him aside and be like, if you want to chase 50 Gs, march this guy forward. Keep him to fight off the back foot. That'll take away his teep kick. That'll take away his kicking game, causing him to constantly move backwards, and then just try to brawl with him in the pocket. If you want to chase 50 Gs, if you want to get your win bonus and get back in the win column and not suffer another concussion and set your life back um, after fighting, just take him down, man. That that should be the game plan. And if he chooses to use it, I don't know where Zayam necessarily just stuffs him and, and keeps the fight standing and beats on him. Like the seven takedowns against Claudio Paulus his last time out, Red barely flag. squeaking by him. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's... More red flags in Canada Day, man. Like, I just, I can't, I can't get behind it. So, yeah, I get that I'm fading a lot of these French guys, but there's a reason, there's a reason why there's not all these French world champions, right? And who's the best one? Benoit Saint Denis, because he can wrestle. Who are the rest of them? It's guys like Cyril Gone, Francis and Gone, who prior to coming over to Las Vegas, like, they, they can't wrestle. They don't have grappling, it's not in their arsenal. And as much as I love Fernand Lopez, the head coach of MMA Fight Factory Paris, a bunch of the guys have left and trashed him for, the guy's just a mitt holder. So I'm interested in seeing, he's got a bunch of fighters on the card, and a bunch of them are largely known for grappling deficiencies, Zion being another one of them, taking on this rock-hard American, chomping at the bit from one of the best grappling heavy camps in the game, knows that that's the winning formula, just saw it. You know how many people were crying online? Sean O'Malley, Marab's so boring, man. It's a, they just can't accept that that's what domination at the highest level looks like. And that guys like George did it, and guys like Khabib did it. Like, if you can do it to a guy, then you're going to do it to a guy. If Bilal Muhammad can win a world championship doing it, Bilal. Bilal Muhammad wins a world championship doing it. Then it's a winning formula. But if you want to chase 50 Gs and risk getting knocked out, then that's completely up to you. Frivola has chased the bonuses, and he's won them sometimes. And he's lost him sometimes. He needs to go out there and chase the win. And that's what the win would look like is taking this man down. So I'll take Frivola because he's the underdog. Yeah. If you look at his record right now with like, you know, contender series going on right now. I mean, losing to Ben St. Denis, like that's, there's no shame in that. Losing to Zayam, contender series on right now. It's that time of yeah. year. His, he's been around for a long time, so he's getting paid a little bit more money these days. Like, he definitely needs a win here. I realize that he hasn't been out of, um, yeah, he hasn't been out of the first round since 2021. But here's the thing, Cody. He's never been knocked out with the new gloves because they basically strap oh, pillows shit. to people's faces now. And, uh, and knockouts just don't really happen anymore. People get rocked a little bit, but like outside of, uh, <laughs> what's her face? Uh, she's already dead to me. Um, Yeah, yeah. she is so dead to me too. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's like, I, I thought about it in the moment. I actually made a gif, I just didn't post it, but it was uh, Cody Garbrandt and her on like the Spider-Man pointing at each other because like they've got all the skills, but like. Just zero chin. She's got to have the worst chin in that division that I can recall 
ever. All but- I'll say, all I'll say, and I know I'm an apologist here, is that that woman is a Mexican, not a Mexican, <laughs> because that would not happen to anybody else. It's true. Like Mexican is said. We see it all the time. We she see, must have been even adopted. Mexican American. I'm guessing she was adopted. Mexican Americans like Brian Ortega could hit the deck every fight and just slow me back up and keep going because he's got that American and you know he's a half half. But those pure Mexican fighters, they would be ashamed of Yuri we getting popped in the and 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 last thing I'm gonna make an apology for. She gets kicked right in the coot right before. So then they like took a break for a minute and a half and then they just resumed and she got cracked. Like part of me was like, had they just resumed fighting, would she have gone cracked? But probably. I don't think her chin's no good. So does, no more Yasmin Yergui ever again. Does Jared have to write down uh, a time code for the word cooch? Are you allowed to say cooch on te- on Canadian television, Cody? Well, it's a cooch kick, right? So I think it's a move. I think yeah. it's the kind of thing that you could you could say. And uh we could say we were talking about Matt Coocher. <laughs> Coocher. Um, I barely know. We're going to watch but, golf. Uh, is he gonna be there? No, no, he's too old. He doesn't get invited to these things. Apparently he's kind of a jerk too. Like doesn't tip his caddy. Oh, yeah, I'm with you on that's, Frivola. That's right. That's right. He was a jerk and yeah. wasn't paying his caddy. Or was giving them like I like, don't know, like half a way, percent. Way or less something. percent than like most people like, than what's customary. Yeah. Right. I think it was like a, yeah, yeah. That's just you know rich golf guys, rich guys in general, right? Classic. Fair always, enough. always trying to, always trying to shortchange it. But yeah, no, I'm with you. Like he needs a, he needs a win here. He needs a win more than he needs 50 G's at this point. He's got, you know, he went on that nice little run, but getting taken down seven times by Claudio Puelas. Impressive that you're able to be on the ground and not get submitted. I will give credit there. Um, so maybe his grappling is pretty solid, or at least his you know submission defense is pretty solid. But big red flag, he gets taken down seven times there. Um, for Volo, it would be crazy to stand at range, exchange with a guy who's taller, has a four-inch reach advantage, and wants that fight to be there. You got to make this ugly. Yeah. You got to take it to the mat. And you got to do that probably for over the course of 15 minutes. For Vola, for Vola by decision is where I'm at on this as well. We're on the same page, which, I mean, recently hasn't been a good time, Cody. But uh, maybe maybe we'll diverge somewhere down the down the way here. We got Ion Kutalaba taking on Ivan Erzlan. Uh, Ion Kutalaba is a minus 120 favorite. Erzlan can be had for plus 100. You got any thoughts on this one? No, this is your biggest who done it on the card. And they got it lined right 50-50 because mm-hmm. it's on one hand Ian Kudalaba is a man with a lot of experience eh, relative to his opponent. He's got a 6-9 and 1 record in the UFC, which means he's a 16 fight UFC veteran taking on a guy making his debut. Still, he's only 30 years old. He's still very young by divisional standards. The best is theoretically yet to come from the man, and yet as you can see from his Six nine and one UFC record. He just can't figure out how to get the win. He has terrible ring IQ. He can strike a little bit, and that he's got a tremendous amount of power. But it's all just like wild overhand right, wild left hook from left field. Everything he throws is one hundred and ten percent. He just absolutely maximizes everything and gasses himself out. He's a former European Sambo champion, so the guy can wrestle a little bit. When he takes you down, he just rips you to the ground, you know, big ragdolls you to the ground, gets on top. And then once he is on top, he's if he tries to hit you, if he tries to get some ground and pound going, he just creates too much space. His opponents get back up, and he's got to take you back down again. If he doesn't try to ground and pound you, if he wants to hold you down, he don't land no numbers, man. He's like a lost guy out there, someone that's got all the skills in the world. When you see him on social media, he's always unbelievably jacked. No idea how he's passed so many drug tests in his career, but... The guy is in phenomenal shape. It's just once he gets in there, he seems to be a one-round guy. Now, he's trying to figure it out. He decides, you know what? I'm going to go to American Top Team. Spends a couple of years in South Florida, training it with one of the best gyms. Really puts a lot of thought to his strength and conditioning, and it doesn't make a difference. Then he decides, you know what? I got to get out of American Top Team. So he leaves, goes over to Extreme Couture in Las Vegas. Spends a couple of years in Vegas, trains with some of the best guys in the world. Puts a really, real big emphasis on creating that explosive power and being able to carry it longer in rounds. And yeah, well, it really it, it does nothing for him. Now he just says, screw it all together. He's married with kids and he lives back in Moldova, which is where he's from originally. So, yeah, I'm sure that there's a great group, a group of guys that are like, you know, helping him get ready. I just don't know to what level. Like, if I'm if I'm sitting here telling you he's only 30 and the best is yet to come, I don't know that it is. I think he's a guy that is an entertainer. He gets in there, he throws down, and he keeps bringing the exact same thing 
every time. Now, I talk to a lot of coaches. We'll talk about a guy, and they'll be like, he's not coachable. He's not coachable. What do you mean he's not coachable? This guy wrestled in college. This guy's a you know a former amateur boxer. He's very explosive. He's young. He's just not coachable. He just doesn't listen. He doesn't listen. What do you mean? Well, you'd have to be there to understand. You could tell him all the things in the world. They just don't listen. Eon is like that. He paints himself green. He hawks out at the weigh-ins. He sees red. He just absolutely red lines on these guys, but he's just not coachable. And so what he brings to the table is if he catches you, yeah, it's going to be a problem. He's got a knockout win over Tanner Bozer. He was able to take down Devin Clark a number of times. He's got a knockout win over Khalil Roundtree. who's about to fight for a UFC title. So like him at his best, he is a wild man who's going to come at you like a Moldovan tornado and 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 might be able to take you out at, at his worst. He's just a one round guy. Gets choked out by Ryan Spann. Gets choked out by Johnny Walker, and then gets knocked out by Candy Injiklu. This is a bad. This is a bad run of things. His last time out against Felipe Linz again loses a unanimous decision. That one's worrisome because you can make excuses when you're getting finished. Oh, Spann just caught him. Oh, Johnny Walker just caught him. Oh, Kenny just caught him. No, Felipe Linz just beat him up. Took him down twice. I struck him 67 to 47. Neutralized him when need be. This guy's, if you're not going to use that explosiveness, he's just so dull. And if he does use that explosiveness, he's just got one round to get it done. So in both scenarios, I don't like it. Now, Ivan Ursland, I'll tell you why this is a good opponent for him. The guy's chinny, man. Like, he's my Croatian brethren. I'm going to give it to him. But outside of Miracle Crow Cop, we haven't exactly, okay, we, we say Stipe's our guy, but he's born in Ohio. Let's be real. Uh, just like I'm born in Canada, I'm not really Croatian. Ivan, he's real Croatian. I'm going to cheer for this guy every time I can. To be honest with you, though, yeah, look at his record, right? First round knockout win, first round knockout win, first round knockout win, first round knockout win. He loses to Thomas Narkun because it goes 51 seconds into the second, and he gets re naked choke. Beats Piramsa Miswala on KSW, first round knockout. Luis Henrique to Silva, UFC veteran, knocks him out in the first round. Wins another first round. Ibram Chugayev, right? It's a KSW title fight. He actually goes five rounds with him, but he loses 50-45 across the board. He throws almost no punches, and he gets dropped twice. So like his durability is a massive question mark. And he's similar similar to Eon. He's not trying to throw a ton of punches because he knows his gas tank's not that good, but he rebounds from that by getting a first-round knockout. Then he loses by first-round knockout. Then he wins by first-round knockout. You can watch all those fights online. A lot of them are bangers. The guy's tight. He's very big and physical. And I I'll be honest with you. I know I made an USADA joke about Eon. I don't know how this guy's passing his drug tests either, especially now that's his first fight. Oh, he's in Paris. He's not even coming to Vegas or anything. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he passes or he doesn't. But he's shredded up, ripped up guy. Massive amount of power. Kind of a little bit chinny. Doesn't have got a great gas tank. His takedown defense, though, it looks solid. Like that Ibrahim um, Chuzagaya fight. Chuzagaya is another one of these just Russian, I can do it all type guys. Undefeated, long, or not undefeated, but bare, basically undefeated. I think he's once beaten, a couple times beaten. Um, anyways, he's a, he's a top light heavyweight in the world. He's able to stuff his takedowns for the most part. At one point, he gets dropped from body shot. He pops back up. He's buddy his ass in on a takedown attempt on him, and he's able to throttle him off again and just keep the fight standing. I think that'll pose him well against Eon. It's possibility that Eon just cooks him in the first round. Again, Ursula's not exactly the most durable guy going, but I think he just kind of takes his time in that first round, sees what Eon's got. Eon Kudalaba will try to take him down, stuff those takedown attempts, make him work a little bit in that second round, find those openings. I I would love to bet on Eon, but I don't you normally don't because he's such a 50-50 guy. This is a 50-50 fight. They've given him that 50-50 fight. For my money's worth, ursalon has been operating at a very high level in KSW. He seems to have a more polished and refined actual striking base. I would say that he's the better striker, and I think he's got good enough takedown defense to keep this thing upright. So if he can just use that takedown defense, keep the fight standing, he should be able to use that superior striking. But again, it's MMA. They're small gloves. New gloves or old gloves. doesn't matter. If Kudalaba whips one of those haymakers at your face and it hits you, yeah, it'd probably be a short night. He just hasn't really been doing it as of late. So the fact that he's gone home to Moldova, the fact that his social media mostly consists of strength and conditioning and hanging out with his family, I just don't know that he's looking to be a world champion. And it's not that Ivan's looking to be a world champion, but this is his debut. It means something to him. It's the highest payday he's gotten in his career. Not likely. The UFC's probably paying him 14 and 14. KSW would have been paying him better, especially for a title fight. But at least it's a new opportunity for him to go and do something in a new organization over a credible guy that's got tenure within the division. So I'll take Ursulon, but like, don't be surprised to see this thing right near the bottom because it's just a blow up in your face type fight and passing it on it all together or taking an under might be uh, the smartest way of going about it. Yeah, the biggest red flag for me with Eon um, in, that, in that Felipe Lins fight is... Zero for one on takedowns. 
Yeah. I understand that's like he's gassed himself out in a whole bunch of fights, but his striking's never really been good enough to like be able to like extract that from your game. Um, getting taken down twice. I mean, two of seven. Like it was almost like he's like, all right, like we're gassing now, getting finished because we're too tired. But it's like certain guys are just like it's like when we we, we talked about with like McKinney, right? Mm. Where it's just like instead of McKinney getting finished in the first round because he goes goes for broke, it's like, well, he gets finished, you know, late in round two when he took on, like, Nazem Sadikov, right? It's just, like, you, sometimes you just have to, like, accept the fact that it's like, this is what I've got. I'm a, you know, I'm a five- to seven-minute guy, and uh, I got to get you out of there early, so I'm going to put my pedal to, put a pedal to the metal because, like, with all those guys, when they try to, like, really extend themselves, it, it just turns into they've lost the best part of their game, which is explosive technique and, and ability to finish. So um, I haven't done too much research on Ivan Erzland's takedown defense, per se. But if you say it's pretty good, if he can keep this standing, um, it's, it's I mean, it's a 50-50 fight. I don't really intend on you know putting too much money on on either side here probably like degenerate parlays or something like that they'll be like late late down like i think it's pretty 50 50 but i'll take the oh, yeah. ever so slight dog in uh in the newcomer Erzland here uh we got umar c taking on da woon jung umar c a minus 500 favorite jung can be had for plus 375 your thoughts yeah, I think Umar sees a legitimate prospect, man. He looks like the real deal to me. He's 28 years old, so he's at that point where he's still young, but he's still been able to mature. He's still been able to go out on the regional scene and get some credible victories and accrue a good amount of experience. Moves around a little bit for training camps, but he spent a lot of time at Bulgaria top team working on specifically his wrestling and his grappling. And I think the guy's very physically strong. Again, you look at his regional show record, it's mostly first round finishes, but he loves the rear naked choke. If he can knock you out standing, great. If not, what he'll do is just get a hold of you, peel you to the ground, work his way to the back, grab that choke. And then once he grabs it, it just seems like most guys just haven't really been able to find an answer to it. You look at his, his uh, proportions as well. He's six foot four with an 83 inch reach. So he's another one of these guys that just brings a lot to the table. On one hand, he's so long, he sits on the outside and he picks away at you, causing him to eventually get frustrated and have to close that distance. Once you close that distance, he's going to be able to take you down. You see all these first round finishes. It causes you to wonder if maybe he's one of these guys that will tire the longer the fight goes. But his fight with Paul and Bengala, Aries FC uh, three, um, yeah, I mean, he goes 15 minutes, pretty no problem. And then he comes back at KSW 72, same thing. Another 15-minute fight at a catch weight of 210 pounds. I think his cardio is pretty good. I was very high up on him when he fought his UFC debut against, uh, it was supposed to be Antonio Tricoli. Tricoli realized he was about to get killed, so he jumped out. In comes Tuco Tocos. Tuco Tocos, not bad, but he's very much just a striker. What C can do to these guys is just blitz them to the ground, get their back, submit them. He's very explosive. He's very athletic. Again, he's not too young, not too old. He's someone that's learned a bunch of skills already and now is able to apply those skills in the UFC. He's still going to continue to get better because he's going to have to fight better guys. Better level of experience will cause the best of him to come out. But at this point, Francis got a legitimate prospect. And what makes him different you and I have been talking about this the entire show, is that he's a grappler. That's what they need. Yeah, it's great to be 6'4", 83 inch reach. And if you had fallen into the wrong hands, somebody would have been like, you should be a Muay Thai guy. You should stand up and you should strike. And you would have wasted 10 years of your career doing that before transitioning over and being 32 years old, jumping into the UFC with a striking predominant background. Instead, he did the right things by getting with Bulgarian top team. He did the right things by learning how to be a wrestler and a grappler. And again, I think that the... Very, very bright future for him. So the UFC needs to give him a tough opponent because he's a good prospect. He needs to prove that. And uh, they've given him that in Don Wong Jung. It's a very winnable fight. It's a very good fight. But at least it's somebody with a pulse that presents some problems. The thing with me for Don Wong Jung is just very inconsistent. Da Wu Jung, sorry. Um, at his best, yeah. I mean, he's picked up a couple decent wins along the way. Uh, Kennedy and Jaku, he's able to knock him out in the first round. He beat Thick Willie Knight. Got eight takedowns over him. But it's all the outside trip. And... That's kind of what he brings as well, is that he's six foot four. He's six foot four with a 78 inch reach, and he's able to use that size on a lot of guys. When the UFC matches him up with these other fellow big men, Dustin Jacoby, Carlos Alberg, in this case, Umar C, yeah, I don't know that he necessarily has that edge. Sometimes he likes to wrestle, as we talked about the Willie Knight fight, getting eight takedowns. Other times he can't get those takedowns. He's forced to strike. He's very much a generalist. His striking's not good, his wrestling's not good. He used to have decent durability, but then you see Justin Jacoby knock him out in the first round. 
Carlos Alberg his last time out knocked him down and then took his back and choked him out with a rear naked choke. Carlos Alberg, a kickboxer, a career kickboxer, rear naked chokes so him. His durability is not great. His submission defense is not great. Uh, there's really nothing great about him. He shows up. He's got a pulse. He's willing to throw down. If you're a fraud or you're a chinny, he might be able to catch you. In this case, I don't think uh, Umar sees any of those things. I think that um, Wu's going to try to come in. Da, da Wu Jung, sorry, is going to try to come in, try to get a, a beat on him, try to corner him a little bit. But at some point, I think C's just going to take him down. Once he does take him down, he's going to open him up with short elbows, eventually pass guard, eventually end up on the back, grab that rear naked choke. Same way Alberg did it, probably just a lot more efficient. So it's a good fight because, again, it's a barometer test. I think he's an uber prospect, but you still have to beat these salty journeyman type guys to prove it, right? You're not going to jump into contention right away. So beat a few of these guys. I think this is a great spot for him. So sign me up for C to uh, hopefully keep the hype train and the undefeated record going. Yeah, what I liked about C, especially coming into like that first fight with uh, with Tokos, was that like I, I mean it's not like world class opponents, but he had fought a couple UFC guys in his lead up to getting signed with the promotion: Luis uh, Frankenstein, Henrique da Silva, Ildemar Alcantara. Not by no means are these guys world beaters, but they've been around the block. They've been you know, back in the day, they were fighting at the world's highest level, and he dispatched of those guys in the first round. The grappling's on point. Um, the only question, I mean, minus 500, and then Dawoon Jung's fights have been very, very volatile. Like, yeah, he landed the perfect, what was it, the perfect, like, elbow against Kennedy and Juku. Um, and that was, just, that was just MMA being MMA, but just, like, he just... Just landed the perfect shot. So it's like his fights have been a little, obviously 205 pounds. These guys are both pretty big. Like there is the risk of that. C hasn't really been tested enough in that department for us to know. Like maybe this guy can't take a punch. I think he wins. I think he looks like the real deal. Um, and we may not even find out in this fight um, about those other intangibles because frankly, he's just running through everybody he should be able to find the takedowns early and often that that tokos fight i mean it was three minutes and 43 seconds he controlled for three minutes and 30 seconds of the so like everything but 13 seconds of the fight he was either like you know looking for a takedown or on top um just complete domination uh, will jung cause him any issues maybe he could land a clean shot but i uh, i'm i'm not i'm not too high on dawoon jung by any stretch of the imagination. And I think Umar C is the real deal with you. So he's a pick for me as well. We've got uh, Ludovic Klein taking on Ro, Ro Roberts. Uh, Lou, Ludovic Klein is a minus 900 favorite. Biggest favorite on the card. Roberts can be half a plus 600. Uh, what do you think here? Yeah, I think we're all going with Ludovic Klein, right? Klein, you you look at him back in the day, he's very got a lot of skills, got a nasty left high kick, he's a very athletic fighter, but there's just something missing. Right? There's just like a secret ingredient that's just not quite there. And so uh, he ends up losing to Michael Trezano at 145 pounds, gassed out, got dog walked. But his very next fight against Nate Landwehr, gassed out, got Anaconda choked in the third round, dog walked, 145 pounds. And then it's like someone came to him and was just like, dude, Let's go up a weight class and stock on a bunch of thick EPO, ripped up, shredded muscle. And then you can just hear the 80s montage, right? Him training like Ivan Drago. It's like, you got to push it to the limit. And then this guy just in the forest doing something. Now you see him. He don't look the same, man. He is thick and he is juicy. And he's moved up to 155 and he's 3 0 and 1 at 155 now. So. I mean, I really like what he's doing. And what, what he does best is that he was always known for that that slick striking that, I, again, as I mentioned, a nice little high kick, um, able to kind of sneak in some of these techniques with his opponent really picking up his rhythm. But he's mixing up his wrestling now because, dude, this guy's thick, man. He's he's dense like a brick wall, and he's fighting like it. Uh, the winning streak includes Devontae Smith, right? Okay, sure, not a great fight. The next one is Mason Jones, a lot better. Jai Herbert, I thought he lost the Jai Herbert fight. Problem is Jai Herbert lost a point in round three for low blows. That caused it to be a draw on two of the judges' scorecards. Uh, isn't that great? And then, and then, boom, Ignacio Bahamondes. At this point, he starts mixing in some grappling. It's 1-1 versus Bahamondes. He's doing an excellent job of negating the much larger man. But in the third round, knows it's 1-1. He goes to the wrestling, neutralizes him, rounds him, takes the round, three takedowns overall. AJ Cunningham, he's putting a life-changing beating on AJ Cunningham. Like, everything's landing. He's dropping him. The thing is, AJ Cunningham's had a really rough life. Uh, don't ever watch his episode of the Contender Series. Ooh, it's nasty business. 
But yeah, I mean, you got to kill the guy to take him out. So Klein eventually just realizes I got to kill him and he does. But the takedowns as well, being able to just realize I can tee off on this guy at will. I'm the way superior striker, but it makes a lot more sense to take him down. Why just stand and bang? Why give the guy the shot? So now him being able to mix and blend his his striking with his wrestling and kind of grow on that base, I think he's just fighting these a lot smarter game plans. Last time against Thiago Moises, blends it all together. Two knockdowns, outstrikes on 56 to 24, and mixes in a takedown. Moises is a black belt. Moises is an excellent grappler. Klein kind of does it all. So he's not an old fighter. He's starting to mature. He's starting to come into his own. And I really do think that he's figuring out how to put his style together and get comfortable in there. It's just been making a world of difference. In this spot specifically, he's initially supposed to fight Nicholas Moda. Nicholas Moda's coming off a nice win, but he's not a great fighter. My point being is that Roosevelt Roberts has taken this fight on short notice, and that's the point of where he's at in his career. Roosevelt Roberts hasn't won a fight in the UFC in over four years. That win in the UFC was Brock Weaver, cut. His win before that, Alexander Yakovlev, was a Russian rapper, cut. He beat Thomas Gifford, who went 0-2 in the UFC and got cut. Beat Daryl Horcher. Daryl Horcher went 1-3 in the UFC and got cut. And he beat Garrett Gross on the contender series. Garrett Gross now traps alligators and snapping turtles in Tennessee and is married to porn star Karma RX. So nice. Roosevelt Roberts has beaten some, like, they got some name to a certain extent, but, like, none of these guys you would really consider to be a, that much of a credible victory. Um, he had a decent win over Kevin Kroom, but it got over turf. Sorry, Kevin Kroom took it him, first round guillotine choke. Uh, and then, yeah, Kevin Kroom ended up being high on marijuana. So, uh, He's not He's not had a good run in the slightest bit. They decided to throw him on um, Ultimate Fighter after already losing all these fights in the UFC. Throw him on the Ultimate Fighter because it's one of these comeback-type seasons, and uh, he beats Nate Jennerman, and then he loses to Austin Hubbard, and then that's it. They bring him in against Matus Rebecki. He misses weight in the Rebecki fight, coming in at 158 for a 155 fight. It gets changed to a catch weight, and then he proceeds to get taken down twice and arm barred in the first round. His takedown defense is not that good. His grappling defense is not that good. He is a decent striker. He's got a nice little jab. He's got some decent pop on his right hand. If you just want to stand with him, yeah, okay, he's going he's to be able to throw a couple moves here. But he's super flat-footed, and he doesn't really want to throw a ton of volume. Could be the bad weight cuts. Could be the, where he's worried about his cardio, but he's not a super high-volume guy. You see that Ignacio Bahamondes fight back when Roosevelt Roberts fought him. He gets doubled, tripled up on the significant strikes. In the third round, he's getting beat up on the ground by Bahamondes, and then Bahamondes just lets him stand and smokes him in the face with a wheel kick with like three seconds left. It's just an absolute mauler. I like Roosevelt Roberts as a person. I think he's a cool guy. I'd like to see him fight contender series type of talent that, you know, maybe the old guy could, he's not even old, he's 30. Maybe maybe the veteran could show the young kid a few tricks up his sleeve, but to throw him in there versus Ludovic Klein, who's on a hell of a roll right now, who has a wrestling advantage over him, has a striking advantage over him. One advantage I might give Roberts is, Output, you know, like Klein's not the biggest, the biggest number guy, but Klein's going to be landing the heavier strikes and then mixing in the takedowns. In both worlds, the judges should be able to side with him if he doesn't just outright get the finish. So Ludovic Klein, uh, that, that, that's for me this week. The most interesting stat in this fight, just in terms of like the reach, it's, kind, it's wild. So Ludovic Klein's five foot seven with a 72 inch reach. Roosevelt, Roosevelt Roberts is seven inches taller but only has a one-inch reach advantage. So that's kind of wild that he's got, like, such a long frame and his arms are kind of short for his height. Or Klein's arms are obviously insanely long for being so short. But How uh, long is Bahamandes in comparison to Klein? So 6'2", 73 for 75. Six foot three, 75 for Bahamandes. 6375 for Baja Mendez. So yeah. he's an inch taller than Roberts and with a two inch reach advantage over Correct. Roberts. Yeah. He would have had a he would have had an eight inch reach advantage over Ludovic Klein. Yeah, again, listen, that one's one one going into the third. I thought Klein had a lot of success with the striking. Just smart enough to mix in the grappling. I would hope he does the same thing here. Yep. Um, not much to add there, to be perfectly honest. I've never really been much of a Row Roberts guy. Um, you know, back when I was the Pichelle Whisperer, that was like one of my one of my big calls. Um, it was. was Roe Ro was the favorite. That's right. Roe was the favorite against Vince, and uh, that was many moons ago. But nah, he just never really, really overly impressed me. Minus nine hundred is wild, and it's probably not something that like I plan on putting too much, you know, too much money on because MMA can be a little bit wild, but. 
seems to be kind of covered everywhere. It's weird that like Klein's been putting up some pretty good performances, and it's like they're not really giving him. I know he's supposed to fight Mata, but it's like, frankly, it's like that wasn't much of a step up in competition either. Like, I agree. His I agree. win over Tiago Moises, like that's a like this is a this is Matt like three or four steps back in the pecking order as far as I'm concerned. Like Moises is a credentialed BJJ black belt with like experience against top 15 guys. He's been in the top 15 at uh, lightweight before. So it's like the matchmaking here doesn't really make sense. Um, I was looking at Ludovic Klein's Instagram. He's maybe, maybe this is like a gift cause he's got a baby on the way. I don't know. There's like, here you go. Here's, here's, here's some cannon fodder. Go get 50 G's. You've been, uh, you know, we, we've liked having you around here. You take fights all the time. Uh, who knows? But uh, yeah, Klein should absolutely roll. Uh, we got uh, Taylor Lapolis taking on Vince Morales. Taylor Lapolis, a minus three fifty favorite. Morales can be half a plus two eighty. Your thoughts? Okay, so Vince Morales, I'll give him his props. He has been a money making machine on the regional scene, dude. He fights for promotions that you can bet, like if your books takes the good regionals. He fights on all of them: X MMA, Ryzen, Tough Enough in Vegas. United Fight League was a pretty good card. Um, and bro, he just cashes, cashes tickets left, right, and center. In the UFC, though, he's three and five. So he's a three and five fighter who's on his second go around in the UFC. 33 years old. I don't know, man. I don't like him, don't get me wrong. But yeah, he's one of these go through the motions type guys. He comes from a wrestling base and on the regional scene, he can use that wrestling base. But in the UFC, no, he just never really has not been able to get it going. He's got 25% takedown accuracy in the UFC. Uh, Miles John's better wrestler. Miles John's able to take him down. Jonathan Martinez took him down. Draco Rodriguez took him down three times. Eamon Zahabi back when they fought Song Yudong. Domingo Pilarte in the contender series. So as much as he does have that as a base, that's what he came into the sport having known how to wrestle. His wrestling has just not been applicable to the highest level to this point. So uh, he loves this low calf kick. Very good with the low calf kick. He'll neutralize a whole lot of guys and then just slightly outworked them. Slightly outworked them. You look at these fights though, it's very low volume. His UFC fights, very low volume. And then since he gets released from the UFC as a decision guy, he's been smashing these guys in the regional scene. Submits Teruto Ishi Ishihara, UFC veteran with the Dars choke. Joe Penafiel, not a UFC veteran, but uh, Joe the Party Penafiel, he's a pretty solid regional show guy. Second round TKO. Luis Guerrero, second round Darce Choke. Hunter Azur, UFC veteran, Ultimate Fighter veteran, Condensed Series veteran. And he's able to go out there against Hunter Azur and, and submit him in the second round, sorry, the third round with a Peruvian necktie. So again, on the regional scene, his wrestling's better than it is in the UFC and his grappling's more effective than it was in the UFC. And even though he's beaten three UFC veterans, they were all cut for a reason. Now you're jumping back into the mix, and this is very much set up from the UFC. Whereas you can look at certain fights on this card, and it's like, oh, well, you know, how come uh, we were just talked about it? How, how come Ludovic Klein's taking on Roosevelt Rock? Well, that's because, you know, Moda fell out. Well, how come this guy's getting this fight? How come Lopolis, they, they signed, they re signed Vince Morales for the fight. So just like you mentioned with Ludovic Klein, how do you beat Tiago? And then you go from beating Tiago Moises, a known competitor, a fringe 15 guy with the BJJ black belt, who's still young, out of American top. How do you go from beating him to getting booked with the Nicholas Motors of the world? Okay. I feel the same way versus Taylor Lapolis. He's His last two fights are Fareed Basharat, who he went the distance with, and Cody Stamen, who he soundly defeated. The guy's a former champion outside of the organization. He's got a solid record within the UFC of 5-2. and two. He's only... I guess he's 32 years old. Time is to move him on and get these big fights and let you show what the kids got. And instead you re-sign a 33-year-old 3-5 and five Vince Morales to be the guy. I just don't get it. Now, how do you beat Lapos? You got to take him down. Same way Basharat did. Basharat goes 5, uh, five of 16. 5 of 16. So if you want to just try to take him down for the entirety of the fight, yeah, maybe. Cody Stamen, excellent wrestler. Wrestled with some of the best guys in the division. Yeah, he went 1 for 6. So taking down Lapos, yeah, it's a hell of a task. And so now you're likely having to strike with him. I could tell you for sure Vince Morales' is wrestling is not going to take down Taylor Lapos. so now he needs to strike with him. And even though he's got a nice little calf kick, he's a good little striker, he's got a good little run right now, he's always been a low-volume guy. He throws, uh, lands 4.17 strikes landed per minute. And even though Lapos is only slightly higher than that, 
It's the difference in quality. Most guys are clinging on to Lapalus the entirety of the fight. He's not able to get that flow state going. Morales, meanwhile, has had a couple bangers with guys. He's able to throw to his heart's content and still only walks away with 50-60. The fact that he's got this nice little uh, neck attack game, you know, whether it be a snap down, a Dars choke, a uh, front headlock type position, switch it to a guillotine choke, does worry you a little bit. But that's generally from fighters shooting in on you, which Lapalus is not going to do. Or you being able to get the takedown and then set up shop, which I don't necessarily see as well. So I think Laplace just, it may be a uh, decision. It might just be point fighting from the outside, but Laplace is a lot far, faster, better footwork, nice jab, sets up that right hand, uses those low kicks, neutralizes them, stay out of harm's way, wins 30 27 across the board. One judge goes astray and lands at 29 28. All of them for Laplace should take this thing by unanimous decision as a worst case. Maybe he connects on Morales and knocks him out, but Vince Morales can take a hell of a punch as well. So. I would say this thing is going to be the over and uh, a Laplus by unanimous decision. Yeah, even when Laplus gets taken down, it's um, his get up game is awesome. Like that's the thing is that he does get taken down in some of his fights over the course of his UFC run here, um, his most recent UFC run even. But like no one's like taking him down and like except for I guess Cal Cal and Lockeran did have six minutes of control time. Um, that How many, he, he got two, two on what is it? Two on 11 for take. Yeah, I think a lot of it was like, standing yeah, these guys control, are just, though. I mean, yeah, we, so round three, he gets credited for one minute and 44 seconds of control time, but he went, Oh, of eight and Oh, of eight on <laughs> takedowns. So he was just, yeah. I mean, that doesn't score anything in the world of MMA, um, these days, nor should it really like standing cage control is. You know, you can stand there and hold somebody for two minutes. And the other guy, you know, once he gets away, lands a couple strikes. It's like the guy who lands the two strikes. Damage over everything. So, um, yeah, sometimes you have to, like, dig a little bit deeper into, like, these control time stats and stuff like that. Um, yeah, his get-up game when he has been taken down, he hasn't spent too much time typically just lying down on his back. And um, Morales isn't some sort of world beater from a wrestling standpoint. Um, Lapalus should double him up in strikes and uh, probably win a very, you are very, very clear unanimous decision here. Um, Eileen Perez takes on Daria Zelenikova. Daria is the underdog at plus 200. Eileen, uh, AFP, the female Nirmaga Madoff, as she likes to call herself, uh, is minus 240. Um, I don't love betting. I, Eileen's shown us so many signs, Cody, of like just like big time red flags when she's favorite. I know that like she sticks to a game plan. She is tough, but it's like she has got banged up a bunch of times in many fights at this point. It's been uh, pretty, pretty dodgy. Uh, she is not the uh, the second coming of Habib, despite everything that she will tell you. Are, are we enacting the Pat Mayo CF dot model here? Because if you tell me, I'll do it. Yeah, I think we are. I, I think yes. we are. And this, yeah, this one hurts me because it, if you want to be like, oh, I, I do my tape study. It is very, very clearly Eileen Perez because she's going to get the takedowns. She's the takedown threat. As you mentioned, she sticks to the game plan. Her last three fights, Ashley Evan Smith, she took her down 10 times. Lucy Putalova took her down twice. Jocelyn Evers, she took her down six times. So you know the takedowns are going to be there. Eileen Perez is pretty physical. She should be able to get it done in that regard. I think it's a hometown screw job cooking split decision type win on the scorecards. And I'll tell you why. First of all, yeah, even though Daria Zilanyakova is Russian, but she's very much French. Like she lives in France. She trains with uh, Fight Factory Paris. She's going to be the hometown woman. She's fought in Paris many of times already. She'll get that hometown uh, pop. Now, again, She's a striker. Her grappling, not that good. You watch her fight uh, Melissa Mullins on the... Oh, oof, Mullins turned out to be god-awful. Wowza. Uh, but yeah, again, she's beating Mullins up bad on the feet. Mullins takes her down. She's a bit of a fish out of water. Her UFC debut against Montserrat Rendon, she got taken down three times by Montserrat Rendon. It, it, again, it's not going to be great. Against Eileen Perez, someone who averages in her last three fights 10, 6, and 2 for takedowns, she's going to get the takedowns. The thing is, is that Perez doesn't do anything with the takedown. So she'll get a bunch of them. But as you just alluded, uh, as you talked about in that last fight prediction, they're not necessarily scoring cage control. They're not necessarily scoring a takedown with nothing done with it. And that's Ali Perez's problem. Against Ashley Evan Smith, 10 takedowns and 60 significant strikes, that's great. But you dominate her with wrestling. 
60 significant strikes ends up being her career high. The very next fight against Pudilova. Pudilova can't grapple. She's awful. She's been cut now twice from the UFC. And she got 42 significant strikes landed on her. And actually, it was Lucy Pudilova with one submission attempt. Then she beats Jocelyn Edwards. Six takedowns, a knockdown, only 42 significant strikes landed. And again, Jocelyn Edwards was the one that threatened with a submission attempt. And then, then she wins. And then she does it. You can't even call it twerking because it's like so robotic. It's, I don't want to say it's annoying, but it's like when... It's like when, uh, who's the stripper name who always jumps in everyone's arms? It's annoying, man. It's so annoying. Vanessa Demopoulos. Vanessa Demopoulos just got screwed the other day on that. Good, totally grabbed her glove, man. I don't know what the hell anybody's watching. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What matters you is that complain, these people. Though, you know? No, like, I not should, you, she not you shouldn't so. complain. You should, like, complain oh, quickly, but yeah. still defend the arm bar because uh, they're still ripping your arm off. Yeah, I think you should be defending it and screaming like, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. But in her case, she's saying this is bullshit, this is bullshit, and then just looking at him and just letting it happen. So yep. she's actually screwed, like she's robbed a bunch of people. Not her fault. The judges have robbed enough people on her behalf that her getting screwed on a bad position is actually just like par for the course. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting back to the whole, you barely do enough to beat an opponent. You're not, it's not a first round knockout. It's not a first round submission. It's not a, damn, that's a huge performance. It's like winning a hotly contested absolutely boring split decision and then doing a backflip off the cage it's unwarranted right the the, the little dance and the, i just had a crappy performance I, it's just it's unwarranted and so you get away with it in your las vegas her coaches are they're dancing with her it's like i get she's at a fortis it's a serious gym but it's just a, a an embarrassing look i think that you're barely squeaking by low level talent with a crappy game plan of just take them down repeatedly and hold them down and then you have the audacity to to dance now you're trying to make a name for yourself and clearly it's worked she's a giant favorite or an unwarranted giant favorite going over to france to take on the local fighter and what's the game plan take her down and do nothing with it so i do think she'll take her down but if she does nothing with it now you're leaving it subjective to the judges who might look at damage and if they look at damage and it's coming from the opposition it's not going to go good for you if you're in france and the hot crowd is for your opponent. She's landing the better shots. She's landing those chipping little blows. She's maybe outworking you by the numbers, and you want to do your shitty little dance and hold on to her. Like it's not going to be a clear cut decision. So it's a 50 50 fight, as far as I'm concerned. And the line does not reflect that. So underdog for me here as well. All right, we got Victor Altamirano taking on Daniel Barres, minus 120 for Altamirano, plus 100 for Barres. Your thoughts? Yeah, I've been going back and forth in this one. Like, on one hand, Altamirano seems to be able to push a pace. And Barras, his 35-year-old bantamweight dude, like, he he throws a lot of heat early, but he just doesn't really seem to be able to continue it. So, with Victor Altamirano, again, Paul and I talk about it all the time. Guy's Mexican. He can take one hell of a punch. And so, he's generally with the fight. His striking's not great, but, I mean, he's definitely willing. He's definitely willing to come forward. He, he'll throw some decent volume up, but he doesn't got a ton of sting in his, in his punches. And, uh... I guess outside of a win over a knockout win over Daniel Lacerda, like it's it's mostly just like pretty close. You hit me, I hit you type striking. His wrestling didn't really know that he had it as like a main weapon, but he used it in his last fight against Felipe Dos Santos, where he took him down nine times. Unfortunately, judges went with damage over the nine takedowns, and he loses a split decision. He was in Mexico City for the record. His own people screwed him because they didn't like the control time. So mm -hmm. it's difficult to say. Against Felipe, he's all grappling, right? One fight prior against Tim Elliott, he got taken down six times, absolutely neutralized it, and couldn't get nothing going. He's so unbelievably limited that he's not a good striker. He's not a good wrestler. The two things that you would give from him is he's got decent durability, and he can fight for 15 minutes. Barres, those are like the two things that are lacking from him. This guy is an absolute tornado of a man. Like He comes in, and he puts a beating on you. A lot of his wins on the regional scene over the last couple of years anyways, have been largely first-round finishes. When he fought on the Contender Series against Carlos Hernandez, boy, this guy looked good in the first round, man. Just multiple takedowns, submission attempts, everything he throws standing is very, very heavy set. It's a little bit flat-footed for my liking, but again, he's trying to generate power and force into these hooks. you got to have to be a little bit flat-footed. It's that because he's throwing so hard, in the second and the third round, he's gassed. Once he's gassed, you can definitely start to have your way with him, which Carlos Hernandez does. Carlos Hernandez is very similar to Victor Altamirano. They fought in a very closely competitive fight. I could see Altamirano doing the same thing here, having a bad first round and be able to work his way back into it in the second and the third, ultimately sealing the deal. But 
for Barres, like part of me wonders if he doesn't see Dana sitting there, so he goes balls to the walls. And then and then he got he didn't get the contract. He won three fights on the regional scene, all by first round finish. Comes back to the UFC. He drops Jafel Feel. He drops him hard. Mm-hmm. And then uh, yeah, Feel gets back up, takes him down, and submits him. So there's clear limitations to his game, but he's got his striking advantage over Altamirano. He's got a power advantage, the more damaging blows. And I do honestly think that he could offensively take down Altamirano in the first round. The second and the third round, that's when it becomes dicey. Like, Altamirano can put pace on you, and he's also going to be offensively trying to get his own wrestling going. The volume start going to be there for you. Barras is up one. He needs to win the second. If he wins the second, he coasts in that third. He coasts in the third. Don't have to worry about it. If it's 1-1 going into the third, hit a live bet on Altamirano because Barras just doesn't really seem to be able to keep the pace. And again, 35-year-old at 135 pounds, it's, it's a bit of a death sentence. Sorry, 125 pounds. It's a bit of a death sentence. And uh, even though this guy's very physically strong, flyweight division, if you're a guy that gasses out at 125, oh, it's going to be problematic because most of the division can fight for days. So uh, I, I can't get behind Barras. I got to go slight lean towards Altamirano, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he just gets ragdolled for the first two and then isn't able to amount that big of a comeback in the third and drops a decision. I can see it. I got to hope that good live betting opportunity for Altamirano and that the, the pace eventually breaks on through. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like this fight is pretty properly priced. It's bounced kind of between, like, favorites and stuff uh, multiple times over the course of this fight as well. So um, it all kind of adds up to me um, uh, for being, I mean, uh, in terms of a pick, I, I'll, you know, I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to say, say Barrez does the more impressive things over the course of two rounds, holds on, and and gets the decision. But, like, I really don't have much intention of betting this fight. The one thing that has maybe a little bit of attention from me is, um, and it's too early in the week, obviously this is a fight way down the card, but, like, Barra's by submission. He's got some submissions on his record. You look at, like, and I think Altamirano has made some big improvements in that department, don't get me wrong, but it's, like, you go back, particularly to, like, his... uh, his run um, as an amateur, and he was just getting subbed left, right, and center. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's like plus 1250 is like the early, early line. So, like, you may get like an absolutely nuclear mental line. I wouldn't mind throwing a little sprinkle on that because, uh, you know, the he's not going to knock him out. If he's going to get a finish, how is he going to do it? You're not knocking out Victor Altamirano. Uh, he is a Mexican, not a Mexican. Mm. Uh, we got Jacqueline Cal- Cavalcante taking on Nora Cornhole. Uh, Cavalcante minus 200 favorite. Cornhole can be had for plus 175. Cornhole coming off of the win over the aforementioned Melissa Mullins last time out. Before that, she was in a very, very hotly contested fight right here, I believe, in Paris, France. And uh, a lot of people thought uh, that she, you know, she got taken down, held down a whole bunch over the course of that fight against Jocelyn Edwards. And, uh, you know, there was some some baguettes uh, uh, brewing in the air, Cody, a little bit of home cooking, perhaps. Um, Cavalcante, good striking, great volume. I mean, my only concern here would be one CF dot model, two. We're in Paris, France, and that arena, that Accor Arena in Paris, France, like they're pretty excited about about MMA. Still, it's like they will probably be there in full force pretty early, and there'll be a pretty loud crowd. My only concern is that like is that the the crowd kind of affects, and you get like a greasy split decision here. Wouldn't be shocked to see Nora get like doubled up on strikes and somehow. You know, the judges get you again type of thing. I think all things equal and fair and taking that narrative out. Cavalcante keeps this, I mean, at range is just able to throw more volume, more impactful strikes. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, hometown, you know, has a fan base there. That is my concern. And obviously Cavalcante coming over from, um, you know, from from South America has me a little bit concerned as well but uh yeah Cavalcante will be the pick I don't really have much intention of betting it what about you yeah I think I'm gonna take the underdog shot here on Nora Cornole uh first time better first time better long time listener first time better on Nora I don't think she's any good let's be real I don't think she's any good 
<clears throat> but this actually presents a really good opportunity for her. So, yeah, she got signed to the first UFC in Paris card just simply because she was French. But she comes from uh, amateur uh, Muay Thai background. In fact, she fought Jacqueline Calvacanti as an amateur. Sorry, it's her per- first pro fight. 2021, first pro fight, Jacqueline Calvacanti, but she loses by unanimous decision. She's won every single fight since then. That fight's three years ago. Three years ago, she loses to Calvacanti. I think part of that's the reason why it's running it back here. But they both come from a striking background. Cornoli doesn't really have much of a ground game. In fact, that's a giant hole in her game is her ground game. But Cavalcanti's not going to expose it. Cavalcanti does not want to grapple either. She's just looking to strike. So if you've got a heavy set favorite, right, uh, they, they got to be able to just win how they want to, not it's going to be striker versus striker. Last time they fought, it went to decision. It's three years ago. Now you're fighting her on short notice in France in a striking battle. Uh, yeah, Paul, Paul, you mentioned it yourself. I mean, why couldn't it be hotly contested? Why couldn't two of the three judges decide to side with uh, the, the the fighter that's getting the more crowd interaction? Beyond that is that after she loses to Jacqueline Calvaconti, she goes on a solid little run. She beats Priscilla D'Souza. Uh, there was another little one. Signs with the UAE Warriors, picks up a couple wins there. Debuts with Jocelyn Edwards. Okay, so this is what I'm getting at here, why I don't mind it. CF dot model for sure. It's women's MMA. Expect the unexpected. I'm going to take that plus money. When you look at Jacqueline Calvaconti, right? She signs to the UFC. She beats uh, Zara Farron. The fight goes to decision against Zara Farron. She lands 126. So it's just striker versus striker. She lands 126. Okay. Her fight with Jocelyn Nunes. This fight's one month ago. August 24th. One month ago, she's a giant favorite over Jocelyn Nunes. I put her on my top ticket because I know it's going to be striker versus striker. And I got someone in Jocelyn Nunes who has no neck and only spams overhand lefts versus a credited former Muay Thai champion in Jacqueline Calvacanti. Paul, she won a split decision and a greasy-ass fight. She's backing up the whole time. She's eating some big shots. She looked tired to me. She gets a split decision win. And then Nora Cornell, she gets booked on this fight, this card against Jermaine Durandamy, a former world champion. Jermaine Durandamy gets hurt. They pull Calvacanti out of left field. She just fought a month ago. She sustained quite a bit of damage. She's straight up just a striker. Now you're putting her in a straight-up striking match. We're sure a girl she beat three years ago, but again, now she's the one on short notice taking it in France. And what's her path to victory? Volume. Because if you look at Calvacanti, right, she's a volume fighter. She lands 126 against Zara Farron. She landed 91 against Jocelyn Nunes. Safe to assume her 7.23 strikes landed per minute, pretty impressive. When you look at Nora, ah, she only shows 36 and 40. Here's the difference. When she fought Jocelyn Edwards, Jocelyn Edwards took her down five times on eight attempts. Jocelyn Edwards had eight minutes and 42 seconds of top control. Despite that, she still outlanded Jocelyn Edwards 40 to 18. So you say hometown baguette cooking, and I'm the idiot that had Jocelyn Edwards. She beat Jocelyn Edwards. Why? Because Jocelyn Edwards got the five takedowns. They didn't do anything with it. She doubled her up in the numbers. My point being is that she didn't have 15 minutes to strike. She had seven and a half minutes to strike because she was taken down all the time. In the seven and a half minutes, she put up 40. Her fight with Melissa Mullins. Melissa goes one for four on takedowns and has five minutes and 20 seconds of control time. Five minutes. Mind you, the fight only lasted a little over eight minutes. 520 of that is Mullins taking her down. The three minutes that Nora had to operate, she landed 36 significant strikes and it knocked down with the knee to the body. So she's just as high volume as Jacqueline Calvacanti. The difference is, Calvacanti's fought Zara Fairn and uh, Jocia Nunes, two strikers, whereas Cornell has fought two grapplers that have been out grappling her. I-, I tell you, man, just stand in front of her for 15 minutes. She put up over 100, and I expected to do that, and I expected to go to decision, and I expected to be close, and I expect people to online to think maybe Calvacanti won, and I expect the decisions to give a greasy split decision to Nora Cornole. So because of this generous plus money, I'll take another random underdog shot here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm switching my pick. I'm gonna switch my pick. CF dot model. She could get yeah, out volume. Model. She could get out volume, I suppose. But, um, but uh, I I kind I made a mistake when I was speaking earlier. Calvacanti's not from like South America. I said like, oh, coming over Portugal. From, she's Portuguese. You know what they yeah. say? Never trust the Portuguese. And the French don't. Let me tell you. No, no, definitely not. Um, I guess wait, wait, wait. All right, it is a little. She's born in Brazil. But now she fights out of Portugal. She probably swapped those things. It's a lot better. 
go over to Fighting Nerds or something. Maybe I'd pick you. But no, CF Dot Mono. Yeah. Cornell's the pick. Uh, finally, we've got uh, Bolaji Oki taking on Chris Duncan. Oki, a minus 200 favorite. Duncan can be half a plus 170. Duncan's kind of like a mass, uh, uh, you know, jack of all trades. The big issue, and we've talked about a million times with him, is that like the durability's kind of reared its ugly head multiple times. Like I think he's making some good improvements. He's at a great gym, and so on and so forth. But um, that chin is is a bit of a is a bit of an issue for him. He's been, you know, Borshev was able to knock him out in the second round. Uh, Manuel Torres, I mean, that guy's an absolute tornado early. But like, if you're able to take some durability, we learned with the Bahamondes that. Bahamondes was able to, you know, kind of dog walk him and, and absolutely dominate him. Like, ate a couple shots and was just like, well, not enough to knock me out. Good luck to you. Um, Oki looks like an absolute unit. But the Kwamba fight was a bit of a red flag going to going the full decision. Somebody was actually able to stand up to his, his punches here. I don't know. I've... Minus 200 on Oki has me a little bit terrified here, Cody. Uh, Can the chin of Duncan hold up and can he use that uh, savvy grit, maybe a more well-rounded skill set, and and cash as a plus 170 dog? Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this one. We've been picking these types of dogs all night, but but this one I'm just I'm still on the fence a little bit. So maybe you can talk some reason into me. But it's the same theory and concept that we've been going with. Is that on one hand you got Balaji Oki, he's a physical specimen. The guy absolutely hits like a unit. Uh, he's well put together, but he's a he's a what would you call a Belgian fighter? What would it be? Uh, Belgian. Belgian. He's a of course idiot. He's a Belgian fighter, but he hasn't left Belgium. So really he hasn't left the confines of his small town and small gym. Now there's some excellent Belgian kickboxers out there, stand-up strikers, excellent. And he looks to be a very solid stand-up striker. It's at how good is his grappling. When you look him on the contender series against Dylan Salvador, Dylan Salvador originally from France, now lives in Atlanta, I believe. Um, he's a Muay Thai guy, he's a straight up Muay Thai guy. So you got two strikers going at it. Very nice that he's able to knock out Dylan Salvador. Quality victory. Guess the contract to give him Timmy Kwamba. Timmy Kwamba, I mean, he barely won his fight in the contender series. I didn't think he should have got a contract in the first place. He's only like 24 years old. He's not a great fighter. He's not super well rounded. Oki's a massive favorite, and Oki's expected to put him out. Yeah, I saw the same things that you saw, right? The first round, Balaji Oki definitely, definitely Dominated. triples him up, dominates the first round. The second round, he's just staring at Kwamba. He's not throwing. He's not moving his feet. He's just standing there. I think he got outstruck 11 to 10, or maybe it's the other way 13, around. He outstruck Kwamba 11 to 10. Uh, 11 to Very 10 on close. significant strikes. Yeah, 13, yeah. 10 on regular uh, total strikes. The second round is a wash, man. He's just not doing anything. And Kwamba is not doing a ton, but he's doing a little bit more. And then Kwamba takes him down. Once Kwamba takes him down, he goes to work from top position for the last 90 seconds, and Kwamba wins the second. So now it's 1-1 going into the third. Oki looks like a flat-out fraud. And, well, I'll give him the third round. You know, he did march back a little bit. He landed the jab. He landed some decent shots. Kwamba started to fatigue. How one judge gave that round to Kwamba, I, I'm, I can't tell you, dude. I have no idea. I thought Oki won. But there wasn't a huge sense of urgency. Again, he seems to be one of these guys that his win condition probably is the knockout. If you can force him to really fight an extended pace for 15 minutes, probably not going to be all that good. And I keep going back to that Kwamba takedown. So I think Kwamba was like one for four on takedowns. It wasn't like he took him down at will. But what's Timothy Kwamba's uh, take? Is it 25%? 27% takedown accuracy is what he's rocking. And yet, you know, he took down Oki, and when Oki was on his back, he didn't really seem to have that great of a get-up game. The round ends. That allows him to get back up. But I almost do see it as a red flag. Duncan, meanwhile, he is more of a striker, but he's been using his wrestling a lot more. As you mentioned, he took down Borishev twice. He took down Omar Morales five times. He took down Yanal Ashmus twice. And he took down Manuel Torres once in his, in his most recent outing. So overall... Only 38% takedown accuracy, but that's because he's shooting multiple takedown attempts. I mean, he's willing to chain wrestle if need be. He's strong in the clinch. He put in a full camp at American Top Team. 
He's definitely in good shape coming into this fight. And it's that ability to maybe just take the fight to the ground, right? You know that uh, Oki doesn't have a great get-up game. And his takedown defense is maybe suspect. If Duncan can take him down and just rack up some top control by by just not even even tire just huge ground and pound, just, yeah, just tire this guy out. Then all of a sudden, the second and the third round, he's less explosive. He's less in your face. He's less prone to landing that kill shot. Duncan has started to rack up a little bit of experience. He's 3-1 and one in the UFC. He lost his last fight to Manuel Torres, but he rocked Manuel Torres prior to getting finished himself. There's some decent takeaways. Again, you check him out on social media. He's definitely in very good shape. 31 years old. This would be considered the prime of his career. And one has to wonder if the more seasoned 31-year-old with the wrestling could maybe present some issues for Oki. But I've taken a lot of those shots all card, and I'm not I'm not just sitting here forcing them. I'm not just, oh, the plus money is the value, guys. Like It has to make sense to me. And I play this thing out a thousand times in my head. I lose sleep over it because I think about these fights all the time. I think at some point, Oki just melts him. He yeah. might get taken down. He might get taken down. He might get taken down a few times. But Duncan is not a lay in, a lay and pray type guy. He's a take you down and try to do something with it. I think at some point, Oki ends up getting back up. And that's the issue with Duncan is that Duncan knocked out versus Borishev despite a good start. His fight with Charlie Campbell, he got rocked in the fight with Charlie mm-hmm. Campbell. His fight with Manuel Torres, he gets rocked in the fight with Manuel Torres. Like, he fights a bit of a dangerous style and he's a little bit slow in the pocket. What he wants to do is just corral you, get a hold of you, rip you to the ground. But Oki guy that's going to be able to move laterally and is fighting in a big cage probably just walks him in on something. So it's the first fight of a 14 fight card. I'm not going to be super heavy invested in Oki anyways, but I suppose if your minus 200 blows up in your face, there's opportunities to roll on. But yes, Duncan very much a live underdog, but there's just other dogs that I think will fight for my dollar a little bit more than Duncan might. Yeah. For me, for me, it's dog or pass, but it will be like I I don't plan on betting Duncan. I'm a, just I I mean his biggest flaw that I see in his game is akin. It's in it's in uh, it's matched up with o- Oki's best ability, which is knockout power, particularly early in the fight. So um, relying on Duncan to go in, get takedowns, tire it out. He has to fight a very, very smart, perfect fight where he's like, oh, he just has to land one bomb. Um, not yeah. one I really plan on betting, but uh, I'll side with Duncan strictly because these new gloves have ruined knockouts. Um, that's really, uh, I'm not going to bet money on it, but that's where my that, that's where my mind is at on these. Lots of overs these days, but uh, maybe that'll flip. Maybe maybe they've changed the gloves a little bit again, but um, it seems like the knockouts are even like certain fights from the other night were like, um, or like two weeks ago, the Ode Osborne fight. It's like yeah, I feel like in a past UFC, like that fight got finished in the first rounds, just like just the, the smallest little difference in terms of power um, not transferring through. In a lot of these fights. Or maybe it's a complete... Maybe it's just completely random. I don't know. But anyway, we're just about out of time. Before we go, Cody, hit him with the PRP. Yeah, we got a lot of dogs this week, so hopefully they be barking. But uh, main event, we're going to go with Benoit Saint-Denis. Brandon Allen's dog number one. Uh, Joannis and Brito. Kevin Jusset, dog number two. Morgan Sherrier. Matt Frivola, dog number three, technically. Um, Ivan Urslan. It's pretty basically like... Even money, so I don't know there's a dog there. Umar C, Ludovic Klein, Taylor Lapolis, Daria Zelikanova. I messed that one up. Daria Zelenskyakova. That was way better, but just not clean. Uh, but anyways, yeah, that was, that was dog number four. Victor Altamirano, basically even money. Nor Cornoli, dog number five. Duncan Oki, like, if you want to chase the dog, I ain't going to fault you, man, but I, I will side with Oki, and I just hope he just clean cuts him with one at some point. So yeah, again, you got 14 fights. A lot of the dogs I do think come through. There's a couple even money fights and then the favorites for the most part. Yeah, they should do their own thing. But this mixed in with, I know there's a PFL Europe this weekend. There's oh, there's all types of stuff going on this weekend, to be honest with you. So another just solid combat sports weekend where there's multiple spots and you can kind of pick and choose what, uh, what you like the most. 100%. All right, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Jared and Cody Saftik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh, oh, oh. Oh.